No, I made it public. I don't even care anymore. <laughs> Hurry up. I don't want to hear myself talk. Okay, we're going to go ahead and go. All right. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, I got my Emily table back. It's the Emily's. Or if we if we want to make it a plural, we can call it the Emily, the Emily I or whatever. So um, I wanted to uh, really quick. I wanted to really quick go over a couple of things. Uh, so I graded your references. I also graded your um, I also graded your annotated bibs and I graded your introductory paragraphs. So a couple of things that I wanted to let you know. In general, if you wrote me a paragraph, I gave you 10 points because writing is hard. So I gave you 10 points for getting something down on paper because folks, getting stuff down on paper is often going to be the hardest part. Um, I did, however, give you some feedback. So there are a couple of you, I came in looking for a paragraph and I got a whole page and I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. I'm like, you probably wrote a little bit more than you needed to and that's okay. Because you can use that information for later for your intro draft, which will be due in mid-March. So we got some time. Um, in general, here's kind of what I noticed with the introductory paragraphs. So basically I, I gave you individualized feedback, but basically what we have are two different camps of people. So we've got the people who are really, really technical. They're already talking about levels of processing. They're like, we're gonna try to replicate uh, experiment number nine in Tolving and Creek 1975. And the thing is, that's really good for the end of the introduction. We have another group of people who are coming up with uh, kind of real life examples, which I think are really good ideas to capture the reader's attention, but it's a little too informal or it might be a little bit vague. So let's talk a little bit about what an intro a good introductory paragraph should do. So for those of you, um, so for those of you who kind of dove right into levels of processing is this, uh, we're gonna try to replicate this. I think that's totally fine. Save it for the end of your intro. Um, but what I'd like you to try to do is give me an example of um, something that demonstrates levels of processing. So just as a reminder, the levels of processing phenomenon is basically the idea that the more deeply we process something, the better our memory for that thing is going to be. The more that we think about something, the better our memory for it is gonna be. And the way we think about it matters. Focusing on what something means to us or how it relates to us is going to lead to better memory performance. So what I'd like for you to do is think of an example in everyday life where thinking about something deeply actually ends up improving your memory. And that's really all you have to do for that first paragraph. You know what would be really great? If that first paragraph had no citation at all. Get the reader interested before you start throwing citations and experiment ideas at them and things like that. Um, and here's the thing, I am gonna do it Sunday night sessions. I actually had somebody drop in for my Sunday session this week, um, and I looked over an introductory paragraph and I gave them feedback. And I want to be available for you because as we get into writing, I want to be really clear about something. Is anybody really worried about how they're going to do in this class with writing? Raise your hand if you're worried. Okay, let's kind of let's kind of address those worries. Do I expect you? to be like an all-star writer by the time that you're done with this class? No. How many of you have very little experience with academic writing? Like how many of you have written a paper for a psychology class or for a social sciences class that's like what we're doing? Okay, a few of you. I don't expect you to um, be all-stars overnight and I'm not gonna grade you like that. 
here's what I am going to grade you on. Writing is a skill. The more that you practice and the more that you do it, the better you are going to get. So here's what I'm looking for. You want to get an A or a B in this class? Improve your writing every single time. Take feedback from me. Take feedback from your classmates. And I promise you, you'll pass this class. I can't guarantee you'll get an A. That's on you. But you will pass this class. I know you won't believe me. I make this speech all the time. I make this speech every year when the writing really starts to ramp up. The only people who fail my classes are people who don't do the work. If you keep making improvements, if you keep trying your best, if you keep meeting with me, you're going to be fine. I'm not looking for a certain level of writing. I am looking for you to just do a little bit better each time. Can you do that? I think you can. I know you can, and I'll be there to help you every step of the way. You know what'll help in this case? Don't think of me as the teacher who is giving you the grades. Think of me as somebody with a little bit more experience, like I'm your editor. I'm your editor. I'm here to help you make your paper better. And I think if you focus on that and less on the grades, I promise you, you will be fine, okay? So a couple of things that I noticed with the references, and then really quick, I want to talk a little bit about our IRB proposal since that's due next week. Um, so with the references, um, I gave a lot of detailed feedback. I was a lot more generous with the annotated bibliographies because in those cases, I also had to look at summaries. Um, so if you felt like I was a little harsh on the references, remember that it's only 15 points. <laughs> Your paper is going to be worth much, much more than that. Uh, a couple of things that I noticed, just some nitpicky little stuff. Um, if you're having, I, I looked, a few people pulled in retrieved from, and I was able to find DOIs. And there are links that I gave to people for how to find DOIs. Um, don't forget to bold the word references. I saw a lot of people who missed that. Um, the only other thing that I noticed, there were a handful of people that pulled in an article that didn't really have to do with the levels of processing effect. I saw something about pigeons, for example. And so here's what I think happened. When you type in levels of processing in the database, but you don't put the entire phrase in quotes, it pulls in any article that has the word levels or processing in it, even if it does not have to do with that phenomenon. So for those of you, and, and, I, and just to be clear, I saw the title and I'm like, well, that could be about levels of processing. Let me Google the title and see what this paper is about. And then I'm like, no, that doesn't really have to do with levels of processing. I didn't take off points for that, but for those of you who I made comments that those sources weren't quite a good fit, you're going to need to find replacements. So when you're searching for levels of processing effect studies, put it the entire phrase in quotes. It will only pull up papers that have to do with the levels of processing effect. Okay? And if you need some help, Dr. G wants to help you. Let me help you. I want to help you. And also, y'all are looking pretty glum. Anybody want some belated Valentine's Day candy? I got chocolate. I got airheads. I got Sour Patch Bunnies. So please help yourself if you need them. I think we could all use a little pick-me-up. All right. So, uh, really quick, before we continue talking about ethics, I did want to uh, pull up uh, the IRB proposal and the guidelines so that you'll know what to do. And because this is recorded, I'll send the link to everybody. So if you need to go back and look at this, you'll know where to find it. Okay. Yeah, it's warm in here. 
And unfortunately, this little shirt that's underneath my sweater is a fake. It's stitched to the sweater, so I can't take my sweater off. Oh, well, I'll live. <laughs> oh, wait, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I have a couple of different things for you. So I have a rubric for the informed consent and debriefing, which I did push back to next week as well. So your informed consent is going to be about 30 points. And we'll talk some more about informed consent today and what a good informed consent sheet needs. You need to tell the participant what they're gonna be doing and how long. So we're gonna be showing people lists of words and we're going to ask them questions about each word they see. And it's probably gonna take about 35 minutes tops. We need to talk about the risks. It's probably gonna be boredom or eye strain. Uh, any benefits? You need to promise confidentiality and an anonymity where applicable. You need to, at some point in this informed consent, let them know that their participation is voluntary. They need to know that they can withdraw without you trying to force them or, or coerce them. You also need areas for signatures, both for the participant and the researcher. That is important. You can get in trouble if people don't sign those forms giving their consent. I've actually heard of a few instances. For your debriefing, you need to thank your participant for helping. You need to tell them about the true purpose of the study. If you have scared the true purpose, like we're not gonna tell them the true purpose of the study right away. We're not gonna say, we're gonna look at how your memory is for things. We're gonna say, we're gonna give you a list of words. We're gonna ask you questions about them. You can tell them the full extent of what you want, of what you wanted to look at at the end. And additionally, you can give them my contact information if they have any questions. So these are kind of the basic guidelines for this. And I've also included a sample informed consent sheet that I've written before. And I've also included a sample debriefing that I've used before. So you can take a look and get an idea of what I'm looking for. And then finally, uh, let's kind of take a look at our rubric and then I will show you, um, I have a sample IRB proposal and I also have our IRB application form. So here's kind of what I'm looking for. So this is a 100 point project. Here's the good part. Most of those 100 points come from dinky little things. So pay, they add up. So. What components do I need to include? Hey, just filling out the application form itself gives you 10 points. So using the proper form gives you 10 points. The goal and the aims of the study, you have to be very clear what the purpose is that you're studying. Your background information. This is where coming up with those previous studies that you looked at, all of a sudden that annotated bibliography I made you do doesn't sound so bad, does it? because you have to talk about what previous studies have found. Hey, I just made you look for a bunch of papers. You can now use those for this. It's almost like I planned it that way. Oh, wait, I did. <laughs> um, we need to talk about the design. So all you really have to do is go back to Tolving and Crake and look at experiment number nine, because we're gonna replicate that. So read that experiment very carefully. Talk about the risks and the benefits of participation. Our biggest risk, we have minimal risk, but the biggest risk is that somebody's going to become bored. We do not have any direct benefit. They might learn a little bit something about how their memory works, but that's the only benefit. Uh, how do we ensure that data remains confidential? Generally, you'll want to keep that, we'll say that the data will be kept and by the way, since this is recorded, you don't need to write this down. You can go back and listen to this later. The data will be kept in my office in a locked cabinet, and I will lock the door. <laughs> That's how we keep it confidential. Um, we need to talk about consent procedures here. So what do you need to have full points? You need to fill out all of the information on your application form as much as possible. 
Your participants are members of the general psychology classes at CAUTI. They will be seeking extra credit. Make sure that this is expedited review because it is. Make very clear that the purpose of the study is there. So you know how I made you look for five sources? For this, you only need to use those three of those five. So you need to use at least three primary sources to explain uh, what previous research has done. For right now, this only needs to be about two to three paragraphs. So this is kind of a prep for writing your introduction. This is an opportunity for you to get started writing that. And for those of you that wrote more than a, wrote about a page for your intro paragraph, you just need to tighten up what you have. Um, when in doubt, cite. And we'll talk about plagiarism a bit today or Thursday if there's time. Now, this is from last year's class, so I will update this because Rodiger and McDermott is what we did last year. Um, be familiar enough with the design of Tolving and Crake or Crake and Tolving Experiment 9 that you can perfectly replicate it. Write it well. How will you select your participants? What are the composition of the word lists? How will the stimuli be presented? How are we collecting the data? Risks and benefits, if it's minimal risk, say so. If the questions could potentially make people uncomfortable, say so. Detail how your participants' data and personal information will be protected, and how will you obtain consent? Describe in detail and include consent forms if they're relevant. The application form is here for you. So the investigator is you, the sponsor is me. You can give it whatever title you want. I, you could say something like our research methods experiment or something like that. Uh, anticipated starting date, we'll go ahead and say September, 2021. Our anticipated ending date, probably November, 2021. Um, you don't have to name the rest of your classmates. The certification is that uh, my certification, you can use mine. I have human subjects ethics training that I obtained uh, last March. So you'll be good to go with that. Um, you don't need my signature or a signature date. So here we have our review category. We are not exempt. We are expedited, so you'll check that. And here's what's really critical. Which one should you check? You're gonna check this one. Research on group or individual behavior or on characteristics of behavior, including but not limited to research on perception, cognition, motivation, communication, cultural beliefs, and social behavior, or research employing survey, interview, oral history, focus group, program evaluation, human factors evaluation, or quality assurance. So that long one is ours. This is a cognitive study. And by the way, there are research studies that could potentially collect hair and nail clippings in a non-disfiguring manner. Ew, <laughs> not my studies. Okay. By the way, for those of you who would like to do EEG research with me sometime, guess what? EEG research is also expedited. <laughs> okay. Uh, characteristics of the subjects, you're going to pick adults because they are, and we're going to pick college or university students. Uh, write a brief description of your proposed participants, including any population parameters, uh, how the characteristics are relevant or necessary to your research question. So we're looking for students in the general psychology class. How will you access them? The estimated number of human subjects. I'm going to go ahead and say 24. I would love if we got data from 24 people. We almost never do, but we will try. Um, estimated length of time subjects will be involved in the project. About 35 minutes, probably no more than that. Ethical considerations, we're going to obtain consent from individuals and we're going to do written consent forms. Uh, there's the risks and the benefits, the project description, a general description. So this is where you put your aims and your purpose. Detailed description of the methodology. So go back to Crake and Tolving Experiment 9. 
Don't plagiarize from them. Write it out. Be detailed. Make it so detailed that if I were reading it, I could do it myself just from your description. A description of the personnel and their qualification, who uh, the principal investigator who will participate in the project and their uh, qualifications for participation. Um, I'm the principal investigator, or you can be, and you can, that's up to you. And really our qualifications are, I have ethics training and I teach the research methods class and technically I'm kind of in charge of you. So I'll make sure you're not unethical. <laughs> Uh, in, any recruitment announcements, consent forms, instructions, if you want to contact people through email or a flyer, include that. Tell me how you're going to do that. How are you protecting the confidentiality and the anonymity? You don't need to worry about previous approval. Like some of these will not apply. The rubric tells you what I am looking for. If I don't mention it in the rubric, for example, like here, previous approval, leave it blank. You don't have to fill out everything here. Put your signature and you'll be good to go. So this is how you would do a for real, no fooling IRB proposal. And if you, ah, I didn't want to close out of that. Why did I do that? Dr. Gilchrist just gets so, so excited when she talks about IRB. I really don't. <laughs> I find it very nitpicky, but you still got to do it. Ethics is important. We want to treat our participants with dignity and respect. All right, so let's go back really quick to those lecture notes. So one other thing that I have is an IRB proposal that I helped uh, with a capstone student back in 2017. So this is not the actual form, but you can kind of see, you don't have to be as detailed as this. You don't have to be as detailed as this. We spent a lot of time working on this, but notice that we talk about research risks, benefits, study procedures, consent procedures, and personnel qualifications. Take a look at those if you'd like to see what this would look like if we were doing an IRB proposal for real. So part of the reason that I do a mock proposal, by the way, y'all, I used to have people do real IRB proposals for, for the class, but it would take so long to get feedback and to make changes and to resubmit it that we almost ran out of time to do the project. So I do a mock one in step. And because we're doing this research for educational purposes, I just have to let the IRB know that I am doing this and that we are adhering to ethical guidelines. Remember, just because it doesn't require an IRB proposal doesn't mean you shouldn't still be ethical. So I am gonna do another study session on Sunday. If you have questions on any of this, or if you want me to look something over, I will be there. I will be there for you. I will help you. I want to help you. Okay. So y'all want to talk about some interesting ethics stuff now? That is not what I wanted. Where's my stuff? There we go. All right. So the last, eh, I hate that thing. All right. So I want to talk a little bit. So the last time that we were here, we talked about uh, anonymity and confidentiality. And as I talked about last time, those are not the same thing. Anonymity and confidentiality are not the same thing. Anonymity means that I can't tie you to the data. So one of the things that you might be kind of curious about, if you look at an informed consent sheet, so when somebody consents to participate, their name is on something and the date is on something. And then at least for a lot of the different studies that I've done, I'm required to have their demographic information. So because a lot of the research that I've done is grant funded, we are actually required to report all of the demographic characteristics of our participants. But here's what you need to know. So I've got some identifying information on their informed consent sheet, and I have additional information on a demographic information sheet. We keep that information separate. We make sure that we cannot identify a person from their data. So 
So we usually keep informed consent sheets in a separate place or in a separate folder from data as well as from demographic information sheets. Additionally, if I'm running a participant on a computer, I never use their name. I use a number for them instead, so I don't know whose data is whose. So we need to make sure that we don't identify participants from their data. This protects our participants. And by the way, anonymity, how many of you are interested in doing survey research? And how many of you are thinking about wanting to do survey research on topics that could be a little bit contentious? So if you want to ask really sensitive questions about your part of your participants, it's better if it's anonymous because they're going to be a lot more likely to be honest with you if you can't identify their responses, uh, if you can't identify them from their responses. So it protects your participants and it encourages them to be honest. Wow, that is the most obnoxious sound I've ever made sipping through a straw. Let's try again. The students in biopsych yesterday were laughing at me trying to sip through a straw and I said, you know, you're gonna miss this by next fall. You may not get to watch me sip awkwardly through a straw while I'm wearing a mask and you'll be like, I miss those days. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, you do. But now they're gone. <laughs> Emily, how much caffeine is in that monster energy drink? <laughs> it's usually on the side underneath the nutritional information or in the ingredient list. Here, I want to do a comparison with my do zero sugar while we're writing. Caffeine content, 68 milligrams per 12 fluid <laughs> ounces. That is a, okay. We'll find it later. I was trying to make chit chat. Anyway, let's move on. We'll find it later. So anonymity is easy enough. Keep identifying information separate from the data Keep any forms like demographic data away from your informed consent sheets as well. But what do we do to ensure confidentiality? Well, with anonymity, assign code numbers to each participant. Give them a number, not a name. So for example, I usually assign participant data numbers based on when they arrive. So the first person in my experiment is number one. The second person in my experiment is number two. Um, additionally, after you assign that code number, limit access to any list that might link those codes to identifying information. So again, keep your informed consents separate because those have identifiers on them. Keep your informed consent sheets in a separate file or a separate folder from uh, the other data that does not have identifying information. So for example, uh, when I was in graduate school, we had these two massive storage cabinets with locks. One was for informed consents only. The other was for demographic data. So we keep those separate from each other. You need to keep them in a locked location. Y'all, when you write your mock proposal, you need to mention the word locked somewhere. You can't just say it'll be in a folder in Dr. Gilchrist's office. It needs to be somewhere that has a lock. Not that I think that anybody would break in and steal data, but you need to ensure that there are safeguards in place. Now, if you're one of those people that likes to keep your files on a computer, what should you be doing? You should be firewalling it or password protecting it. That is how you lock it if you are dealing with online data. I mean, honestly, I wish I had something like this, like a big chain and a padlock, like that's my data. Mm. I found it. <laughs> what was it? It's 140 milligrams. Ew. I'm going to 
Did you get all your pops out? <laughs> yeah. I heard that. I'm like, what is? I'm like, knuckles. I do get so often that I don't even know. You're not gonna. Well, you're not gonna get arthritis from knuckle popping, but don't do it too much. Some people might have misophonia. Okay. Should you ever break confidentiality? There are going to be a few instances where you have to. So, how many of you are interested in counseling or therapy or things like that? So many of you are very well aware of client privilege. So if I go talk to my therapist or my counselor and I tell them things, they don't get to tell anybody else. However, if we're talking about the potential of me breaking a law, so if the law mandates that somebody has to report this, or if the law permits us to protect somebody. So that can include instances such as child abuse, instances of domestic violence, somebody reporting that they have suicidal tendencies. All of those are cases where you might actually be able to break confidentiality um, to help another person. Now, of course, it is going to vary it is going to vary depending on um, what, your, what your role is. And it will also depend on your own code of ethics. If you are a counselor or a therapist, you will be subject to a very specific code of ethics. For example, here is an instructor. There are certain instances where if you choose to tell me something, I am obligated to report it for reasons related to laws like Title IX. And I will tell you such um, to let you know that I am obligated to report that. But that's only when we're talking about if the law mandates it. You can break confidentiality, but these instances are going to be very, very small. If it doesn't fit into these instances, you can't break it. So for example, if I'm collecting data from somebody in a research study and they go up to me and they go, you know, that person who was here last time, like I'm gonna go punch him in the face. I can't break confidentiality for that in that instance. Um, but there could be instances where I might need to do so or where you might need to do so. Okay. So this is something that your textbook doesn't talk about, but if you are interested in things like neuroimaging, it's becoming more and more common. So I want you to take a look at this person's brain. Do you notice anything a little off about that brain? Anybody here have biopsych recently? So Stella, you had biopsych yesterday. What did I say about if you see something white? That's not the skull. Do we see anything white here that's not a skull? Emily, that's not a good sign, is it? So what do we, it, it could be a tumor. So this person looks like they might have a tumor. So I want you to imagine that you're doing a neuroimaging study and somebody goes in and they get their structural scan and you see this. So what do you do if you find something unexpected like this, what we call an incidental finding, but it's not actually related to the true purpose of the study. They were just coming in for a memory study and you find something like that. Yeah, Mathilde. Are you? Are you obligated to tell them? Are you obligated to tell them? Let's consider a couple of different things. So I think that that's a good question. So here's my question. So if I were running a neuroimaging study and I found something like this, here's my first question. Am I a radiologist? I'm not. Are you? No, you're not. <laughs> you're like, yes, I am. I'm like, yeah, and you're, you can be a radiologist someday, but you're not a radiologist right now. You would want a neurologist or somebody who is a radiologist because you could potentially, in that instance, you don't actually know what you're looking at. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's kind of weigh, let's kind of talk about, let's kind of weigh our options. So what kind of things happen if we don't tell? What kind of things potentially could happen here if we don't tell? Well, they may not. You don't know that they're going to die, but they never get it looked into and it could be serious. Now, on the other hand, what if we do tell them? What if we do tell them what's what are what kind of risks are associated with telling somebody something like this? Okay, they might get mad. This could freak somebody out. Additionally, they're probably going to need follow ups. And that costs money, y'all. That costs money that they may not have. So here's where it's tricky. There are risks associated with telling. There are also risks associated with not telling. So there are also issues related to your competency. So for example, I know enough about the brain to know that if I see something like this, that's probably not a good sign. But guess what? I'm a cognitive psychologist. I'm occasionally, occasionally a cognitive neuroscientist. Here's what I'm not. I'm not an MD. I'm not a physician. I'm not a radiologist. And I'm not a neurologist. I can maybe make the case that something here is not right, but I'm not the one to make a diagnosis. That's not my job. Now, thankfully, what we do have is a lot of imaging centers do have radiologist staff on hand so that if something like this happens, they can send it off to a radiologist somebody who actually has the skills and the expertise to know what they're doing. Now, here's what's really interesting. At least as of right now, there are no clear set of standards for how to proceed with this. It's up to the individual researcher or it's up to the imaging center itself. So can I tell you something? So you see this brain up here? What if I told you that that was my brain and this is something that actually happened to me about 10 years ago? So while you're writing this down, here's a fun little story. <laughs> so I was taking a neuroimaging class uh, in graduate school and it was my first time in an MRI scanner and folks, not to freak you out, I've got a family history of brain problems in my, on my father's side of the family. My grandfather had a stroke when he was 33 years old. My, grand, or my aunt actually died of a calcified brain tumor in her brainstem at the age of 37. To put this into perspective, I'm 38. This decade has occasionally been a little bit worrying for me because I'm like, oh, 30s, this is when stuff starts happening. So. I remember making a joke in class. I'm like, I don't know if I want to go into the scanner. What if I find out I have a tumor? And I do. <laughs> so let me talk about this a little bit. So I got into the scanner and then the my instructor pulled me out and he goes, how do you feel? And I said, that was like being an astronaut. And then he immediately shifts gears. Like this is, this is like, order one and how not to do this. He just goes, we found something in your scan. And I go, you're kidding, right? And he goes, no. <laughs> so then they show me this. And he's had enough experience where he was able to kind of make a good guess, but they sent it off to a radiologist. So I had to go to a neurologist and pay about $800 and then some to actually get this figured out. So here's one of the risks of telling. <laughs> you have to spend money on a follow-up scan and they're not cheap. But basically what this is, 
So I have what is called a pericolosal lipoma. So this is a fatty tumor. It is less of a tumor than it is a congenital defect. And if you'll also notice, my, uh, my corpus callosum, which is right here, is actually smaller than average. It should actually go all the way back here, and it doesn't. So my corpus callosum is about 50% smaller than yours probably is. And it also means that I have some autistic traits. So agenesis of the corpus callosum and irregularities of the corpus callosum correlate very highly with autism. Um, but I, I gotta tell you the truth, folks. When, when they told me, I was freaked out. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> Nobody wants to be told that they have a tumor like that. I'm really glad I know now because I feel like I have a better understanding of how my mind works. But for that first week, it was a little bit scary. There are risks associated with telling and not telling. Now, at the imaging center that I worked at, they told. When I worked at an imaging center at Georgia Tech, it was up to the researcher. So what do y'all think about this? Like, would you tell or would you not tell? What do you think about this? You would tell? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Would anybody not tell? And it's okay if you choose not to. I think I would like send it to somebody who knows what the heck they're talking about. And then if it's something, I'd be like, oh, maybe. Yeah. If you're going to do something like this, one of the best things that you can do because you're not qualified. And remember that we talked about last week the importance of not overstating your expertise. Send it to a radiologist. Send it to somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, if you have a neuroimaging center, you should probably have a plan for things like this because they are going to happen sometimes. And you need to have a plan in place for how you are choosing to do that. So if you wanna send it off to a radiologist before making a call, I think that's a perfectly fine idea. And by the way, not telling is perfectly fine too. You could potentially, by telling, be giving somebody a lot of stress, but ultimately it's up to you. Yeah, Emily. What would you do? I would tell, but that's me. But I also would probably consult with a radiologist first before I told. We actually had that happen uh, when I was at Georgia Tech. We had somebody who, and we actually had to talk to him about it first. His cerebellum was smaller than average. And apparently that was enough that we had to count that as an incident. Um, so just to be clear, don't go spreading it around. Like Dr. Gilchrist is totally fine. This is benign. It just means that I'm a little socially awkward and I have difficulty with eye contact. I'm not going to drop over and die. I get occasional follow-ups with a neurologist. I am okay. I'm not going anywhere, but I got to tell you when it happened at the, I, I was 27 when I found out about this. And of course, 33 and 37 were hanging over my head and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be just like them. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm different. I and I like that my brain is different. It's just, I kind of wish that my instructor had had a little bit better bedside manner, but that's also not the kind of person that he was. But I will tell you one other cute thing and then we'll move on. Uh, at the time, my doctoral advisor was the director of the Brain Imaging Center. And after I found out, I came into his office bawling, like, Nelson, something happened. And I told him what happened and he goes, it was you. He was the director. So anytime something like this happened, they had to send a report to him. And here's what he did to make me feel better. He pulled up stuff on the internet so we could look through it together so that I wouldn't be scared. And that's because my doctoral advisor is one of the sweetest men alive. He is just a very, very good person. And I get to work with him during my sabbatical. So I'm very excited. <laughs> Okay, but here's the thing. We don't really have clear guidelines for this. So this is a critical case where it's important to be aware of your expertise and to be humble. Okay, 
So a couple of things to remind you about when it comes to the IRB. As I told you last time, it may seem subjective. It may seem nitpicky, but you've still got to do what the IRB tells you to. You don't like it? Tough. I know that sounds really harsh coming from me, but the goal is to get your study to be more ethical. You are expected to modify your study based on the feedback from your IRB. And if you don't, if you don't modify it, hey, guess what? You don't get to run a study. The IRB will not approve your study unless you make a genuine effort. Folks, you are also more than welcome to take candy with you after class. Dr. Gilchrist braved the Joplin target. Actually, it really wasn't that bad. Most people were wearing masks, so it's fine. <laughs> it wasn't that scary. There was a sad lack of clothes. I was like, clothes that I'd want to wear right now. I it was saying like clothes on like the people in the No! <laughs> we had nudists in the target, y'all. <laughs> no. Um, no, it's just they have like linen pants and stuff. I'm like, that's not warm enough for linen pants yet, although I might make an exception for today. But linen wrinkles, why would you want to wear that? I will tell you too, when I found out about this, I went up to my lab and my uh, my lab mate basically get, tried to give me a split brain test <laughs> and it didn't work because well, this formed before I was born. So my brain found ways to compensate. <laughs> I mean, it does make my brain special. My corpus callosum wears, a look, look, it wears a little hat. <laughs> it's a cute little hat made of fat. <laughs> I can joke about it now. It's been 11 years. I can joke. <laughs> All right. Are we good here? Okay. Let's talk a little bit about informed consent and why it's important. And I got some really good questions last week about what to do about kids and other groups that may not be able to fully exercise informed consent. So informed consent Folks, it is the most important document, and here's why. This is how you get participants to sign up for your studies. And by the way, you are required to include this information. You, we call it informed consent for two reasons. First of all, the participants need to know as much about the study as possible so that's the informed component. And they also need to be able to give voluntary consent. So you need to talk about the basic aspects of the study, what they are going to be expected to do. And folks, you don't have to tell the true purpose of the study. So for example, in your informed consent, you don't have to tell them we're gonna be looking at the levels of processing effect and see how good your memory is. You don't wanna give away the study. You know why you don't wanna give away the true purpose of the study? Because your participants wanna be nice. Your participants wanna help you out. And if they know what the true purpose of the study is, they might behave in ways that help you get the results you want. And we won't know if it's truly because of the experiment or because they were trying to be good participants. So tell them in your informed consent that they'll be looking at words on a projector and they'll be asked to remember something about them. That's all you have to tell them. So they know they're gonna have to do a memory test, but that's about it. And actually don't even tell them that. 
We don't necessarily want them to know they're getting a memory test. So we can say, you're going to look at lists of words and you're going to answer questions about the words you've seen. That's even better. You need to tell them about the risks. It's minimal risk. They're going to be bored. There's going to be eye strain. <laughs> and that's it. There are no direct benefits here. So sometimes the study has no benefit. You can say something like, oh, you'll learn more about how your memory works. But that's not really a true benefit. So there is no direct benefit to our study. But there is an incentive. If you're getting paid for a study, if you're getting extra credit for a study, which these participants are, that is what we would call an incentive. So you need to let them know they'll receive extra credit for their participation. Now, here's probably the most important part of the document. In addition to telling them what they need to know, any risks and benefits, how long they'll be there, they need to know that their participation is voluntary. They're, that means two different things. They can choose not to participate. So you can give them the informed consent and they can go, you know, now that I've read about this, I don't want to do it. And here's the thing. I don't care if they were interested in doing it the day before. If they say they don't want to do it, what do we do? We say, that's okay. You're free to go. Have a nice day. You let them go and you don't get mad at them. You don't give them a hard time. You don't go, pretty please, I'll be your friend. You don't force them to stay. You do not force them to participate. And folks, it's hard, believe me. I have run studies with kids where we have been there for two and a half hours. We are five minutes away from being done and the kid wants to quit. We only have a couple more trials and the kid wants to quit. You know what you do? In this case, because you've been collecting a lot of data, I ask one question, are you sure? If they say yes, that's it. I don't care if we're five away from being done. If they want out, if they're one trial away from being done and they want out, let them go. That's hard, it's hard but you let them go. That's what voluntary participation is all about. They have the right to not participate, even if they expressed interest in it earlier, and they can withdraw from the study at any point without penalty. So if you said you'd pay them, they still get paid. So in the case of kids that I've run studies with, they get a gift card to Target and they get a book. They still get those things even if they choose to quit. Yeah. So when we're like writing our IRB and everything and there are no benefits, how would we write that? There is no direct benefit to participants. That is what you say. There is no direct benefit to participants. Now here, now there could be a benefit. There could be a benefit if we share the results from our study with participants, but we don't always do that. So go ahead and say that there is no direct benefit to participants. That's okay. They do have an incentive and you can mention extra credit as an incentive, but let's be clear. Incentive and benefits are very different things. So for example, if we were doing a drug study that could potentially treat Alzheimer's, the benefit is you might get a drug that helps treat your Alzheimer's disease. You could also be getting paid for it. The pay is not a benefit of the research, it is an incentive. So one of the things you'll, you'll kind of learn is that with basic research like this, where we're just looking at memory because we wanna see what happens, there's not usually gonna be a direct benefit. If you do applied research, so if you're looking at what educational methods work best, what types of therapeutic methods work best, you're gonna probably have more of a benefit through the research. It is okay if something does not have a direct benefit. Use clear language, y'all, right to an eighth grade level. Like no jargon, don't write like Dr. Gilchrist writes, don't be like me. 
tailor it to your audience. So what I write for an adult's informed consent sheet, I would not write that for a child. And sometimes consent can be waived. Sometimes you do not need to ask people for consent. So for example, how many of you are familiar with observational studies? Do you remember talking about that? Maybe just a little bit in gen psych. So you go out and you systematically watch people. So what if I went up to you and I'm like, hey, I'm doing an observational study. I'm gonna follow you around and watch you. Is that okay? What's gonna happen to my data as a result if I do that? People change their behavior when they know they're being watched. So they're not going to behave the way that they normally would if I've already said, hey, I'm going to watch you. Is that OK? So if you're doing an observational study, you don't actually need consent. Certain types of research. So if you're analyzing a previous data set that already exists, you don't need consent. But for most things, you're going to need consent. <laughs> hey, don't force people to do something you don't want to do. Your participants need to be able to exercise free will. So this means a couple of things. In line with voluntary participation, here's what we don't do. So participate in this study to help the research methods class. You'll get an A in your general psychology course. Yeah, we can't do that. Just like Participate in my 30 minute research study. I will pay you $1,000 for doing so. Here's why we don't do that. Because nobody is going to turn that down. If you could participate in research for an A in a class, would you do it? Some of you are like, I don't know, Dr. Gilchrist, am I being shocked? And I'm like, no, you're probably just going to be bored to death. <laughs> You'd do it. But that's not you exercising your free will, is it? You're basically being prodded by the incentive. So what this means is that you don't give too much money or too much extra credit for an incentive. It's why for 30 minute research studies, we usually only pay about 10 bucks, maybe 15 bucks an hour. In the case of our older adults that come in for studies, it's usually about 10 bucks an hour, free parking right up to near the lab and all the coffee and cookies that they want. That's not coercive. When I was a researcher in Atlanta doing work with older adults, we actually paid them a little bit more because parking in Atlanta and driving in Atlanta and everything in Atlanta is more expensive. <laughs> So in that case, we did pay 15 bucks an hour. So you get 30 bucks for pay participating for two hours. Now that's not nothing, but it's not coercive. You'd turn down $30 if you didn't want to do it. Well, actually you're in college. $30 might actually be a lot for you. You're like, that's five rotisserie chickens right there. I could eat well for the week. <laughs> but you don't pay a hundred dollars for 30 minutes of work so we give incentives that are appropriate so people can actually exercise free will additionally we don't penalize so if somebody goes i don't want to do this study anymore i'm not going to go okay that's fine you're not going to get any money then you can't do that because that will keep somebody in who doesn't necessarily want to stay in this can actually lead to some really interesting things so when I was in graduate school, I know, I know, in this class, you're going to hear a lot of when I was in graduate school stories. So when I was in graduate school, um, here's how we got a lot of our participant data. It's really hard to get good data here at Cotty, which is why I said if we got 24 people, I would be thrilled. Um, so we got a lot of our data from intro to psychology students. And every semester, there were at least 1,500 students on campus taking those courses. And they had to participate in research studies as part of the course. If they didn't want to do research studies, they were allowed to do a paper. Nobody picks the paper. 
Everybody helps out with research. So we had this online system. They were required to get about 10 research credits, which is basically about five hours of research studies. Um, and if they didn't show up or if they didn't let us know ahead of time that they couldn't make it, we could dock them a half a credit. So thereby, make, meaning they would have to participate in more studies. So that was a really good way to basically make sure, hey, if you're gonna sign up for a study, tell us ahead of time if you can't make it. If we show up the day of, we set up for you. In some cases, I was getting up, being on campus at 7 a.m. to run studies. If you don't show up, that's a spot that somebody else could have had and I've just wasted my time for nothing. So we all thought, hey, that's pretty reasonable until 2010. And in 2010, we found out that the Office of Human Research Protections say that docking credits like that is coercive, which I actually don't necessarily agree with. Students who don't want to participate in research are not going to be extra motivated to show up if they if we say we're going to dock them a credit. The students who don't want to show up still aren't going to show up. But we weren't allowed to penalize them anymore. And guess what happened? We had so many students not show up for our studies that next year. It was awful. So we started keeping track of how many students signed up for our studies and then wouldn't show up. And the data was really bad. And so what we ended up doing the following year in my last year of graduate school, if they missed three studies without contacting the experimenter, they were locked out of the system and would have to write the paper. If they didn't wanna write the paper, they would have to write a letter to their instructor explaining why they missed stuff to basically get back into the system. And I don't know about you, but I think the penalization method works easier and is far less coercive because nobody wants to do the paper. But anyway, we don't penalize people for not showing up. We don't penalize them for withdrawing. We want them to exercise free will. So here's the thing. Consent is really easy with adults. It's a lot harder to do this with children. It's a lot harder to do this with groups like prisoners. It's harder to do this with people with disabilities or mental health patients or pregnant women. In these cases, these are what we refer to as vulnerable populations. Under certain circumstances, these populations may not actually be able to give true informed consent. An eight-year-old kid does not fully understand, hey, we're gonna put you in this booth in front of a computer for two hours, and you're gonna look at colored squares for two hours, they're not fully going to be able to understand that the way that their parent would. So we have certain types of procedures in place to protect these populations. So how do we do this? We consider our participant characteristics and study risks to determine whether we need safeguards. So for example, something I know a lot about is doing research with kids. So when you're doing research with kids, and by the way, when I mean kids, I mean children under 17 or minors. With minors, their legal guardian or their parent has to give consent. So they are the front line. And by the way, if the parent or the guardian does not want their child to participate, I don't care how much the child wants to participate. If the guardian says, no, nope, you don't do it. Oftentimes when I was doing research with kids though, I often found that the problem was that the parent was always like, come on, you wanna do this, it'll be fun. And the kid was like, I don't know. So we had to try to make it fun for them. We would tell them this really creative story. So they had to look at colored shapes. And we were kind of like, 
It's like a computer game. It really wasn't like a computer game, at least not a modern computer game. It looked like an 80s computer game, to be honest, like an early 80s computer game. And the kids would always tell us after, that wasn't like a computer game. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> um, but we would tell them a cute little backstory. If they were having fun and they got something right, we had a little box of stickers. We'd give them a sticker. Um, we'd give them bathroom breaks and if they needed a break to stretch or anything like that, they were allowed to do that. So you always have to take those things into account. But we always start with getting informed consent from the legal guardian. And sometimes that can get complicated partially because I know that there were some times where I would get, a, I would have somebody's grandparent because their actual, their actual legal guardians, their parents were out of town. And so we had to get a fax from their parent and they had to fax it to us. And so once we get that informed consent from the legal guardian, we then get what is called verbal assent from children. So by the way, pardon for the typo. So assent is basically they can't understand all of the details of informed consent. So basically uh, what we would do is we would give them a form that had language that was tailored to them. And we would basically say, you're gonna be looking at some colored shapes. This is gonna teach us about how memory changes as people grow up. And folks, we said this, like we always said this. So we'd say, your parents know that you're participating. Um, if you choose not to participate, if you wanna quit, that's okay. And folks, we even said this part. We said, there will be no bad feelings. So we say, there'll be no bad feelings. You'll still get your gift card and you'll still get your book. And I won't be upset if you choose not to wanna do this. So they still wanna participate, but they can't fully exercise their free will and their consent. Now, I've got fuzz on my nose. Um, I'll get some hand sanitizer. I feel like if I touch my nose, I have to get some hand sanitizer right away. Now, let me get back there so that other people can see me too. Now, one of the areas where this can get kind of tricky is general psychology classes coming in. So was anybody here 17 when they started Cotty College? So sometimes that happens. So Technically, if it's not built in, so Emily, I want you to imagine that you got a chance to participate in the psychology research study. Most IRB proposals do not specify what to do with people under 18. So if you had come into one of my research studies, I would have had to say one of two things. I would either say, I don't have any specifications for what to do with 17 year olds, so come back when you're 18 and you can give full consent. Or if I built it into my IRB, I would say, okay, Emily, I'm gonna need, here's an informed consent sheet. We're gonna fax this to your legal guardian and then you can participate. So we don't always do a very good job with this. I frankly think that if you're at college, you're an adult, whether you're 16, 17 or 18, and you should be able to exercise consent for that. But if it's not built into the IRB, make sure that you've got participants 18 and up. Now, there are a couple of other considerations with other types of vulnerable populations. For example, for prisoners, you wanna make sure that they don't get benefits out of participating that other people would potentially not. We don't wanna coerce our prisoners with special treatment, for example. Okay, so, hey, it's the Milgram study. So does anybody not know about Stanley Milgram's obedience to authority study? Does anybody need a refresher? Okay, so the Cliff's Notes version is that Milgram basically looked at when people obey an authority figure uh, by basically 
believing that they were shocking and harming another person. They thought they were doing a study looking at learning and memory and how punishment enhances memory. But in fact, it was an obedience to authority study. People believed that they were shocking a person when they were not actually shocking a person. So you can't really do this as much today. You can choose to deceive people about the true nature of an experiment. However, if you are going to deceive, and let's be clear, probably the most controversial thing about Milgram's experiment is the use of deception. People thought that they killed somebody because there's definitely a point if you delivered a high enough electric shock, the actor falls silent and stops screaming. I don't know about you, but if I'm shocking somebody and they're screaming and they suddenly stop after complaining about problems with their heart, my brain's going to jump to a very obvious conclusion. So if you choose to deceive, that's okay, but you need to make an effort to address these things. First of all, would you get a benefit from deceiving people that you otherwise would not get? So for example, a couple of years ago, I did a replication study with the research methods class where we looked at whether priming an elderly stereotype would cause them to walk more slowly. So by making them think about older people, did it make them walk more slowly? We could not tell them about the true purpose of the experiment because it might have changed how they behaved. So there need to be benefits due to that deception. There needs to be no other way that we could get those benefits. And additionally, you have to be very highly unlikely to experience psychological, physical, financial, or legal harm due to that deception. You probably could not do this study today because of that. This would cause me psychological harm. Let's just say that. How about one more slide and we call it a day and then we'll finish this up and we'll talk about measurement on Thursday. Okay, so when you are done with the study, I have a really goofy analogy here. So for those of you who don't know, I was kind of involved in Girl Scouts until I was a junior Girl Scout, maybe in fourth grade. How many of you were involved with Girl Scouts or learned about camp? Like, was anybody here like campfire kids or anything like that? Okay, so one of the rules that they teach you is uh, when you go camping, you leave your campsite just the way you found it. The same is true with people in your experiment. You need to leave them in the same emotional state they were in when you found them. So when the study is over, we do what is called a debriefing. We give complete information about our study. So in our case, we'll tell them about what we were trying to do, what the levels of processing effect is, and that we were trying to replicate that. It's also a good time to learn about what participants thought about the study. Additionally, if we upset them, if we asked them sensitive questions, we want to minimize any adverse effects about participating, and we want to maximize positive feelings of participating. I always make sure, and I was taught this from my advisor, to thank participants. We could not find the things that we find without their help. You need to thank them. And additionally, you need to make sure that they don't talk about the study with other people. Because if they talk about the study with other people, there could be the possibility that our next participant already knows what the purpose of the study is about and thus behaves differently than they normally would. So we want to try to avoid that contamination wherever possible. So here's the thing. If your, part if your participant comes in and they're not in a great mood, you don't have to leave them with a smile on their face. But if they're upset, 
you need to at least get them back to the emotional state that they were in when they came in. If they were in a good mood, put them back in that good mood. If they were in a neutral mood, just make sure they were in a neutral mood. So if you cause them to be upset, get them out of that state, make them feel good about their contribution. All right, y'all, it's time to go. So thank you so much for being here. We will finish this up next time. We're gonna talk about plagiarism and scientific integrity. And I think we're gonna play a plagiarism game together so we can learn not to plagiarize. All right, have a good day. Help yourself to some candy, please. <laughs>